Great. So well, welcome everyone and thank you so much for join, joining us to the Bridge Artist in Residence Artist Talks and, and Reading. I'm really thrilled to be able to share this virtual space with you and look forward to a really incredible program tonight. I'd like to start off this program with just the reading of our office's commitment to racial and racial equity statement. Um, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture commits to an anti-racist work practice that centers the creativity and leadership of people of color, those most impacted by structural racism, to move towards systems that benefit us all. We also acknowledge that we are in, on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. To begin the program tonight, I'm joined by uh, the artists and a few other speakers, and I'd like to ask to go round robin to introduce ourselves um, briefly, and then we'll begin the program. I'll start. My name is Maya McKnight, and I'm the public art project manager for the Office of Arts and Culture, and have the distinct pleasure of being the project manager for this project. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I, as a descriptor, I am a white woman. I have um, brown hair about shoulder length. I'm wearing dark tortoiseshell glasses and I'm in a room with yellow walls and windows and doors behind me with wood trim. And I'd like to pass it to my co-host tonight, Jose. Hi, uh, I hope you all can uh, hear me. So, yes, I am Jose Alanis. I am a professor of Slavic languages and literatures and comparative literature at the University of Washington. I have he, him pronouns. And in terms of my description, I am a middle aged Mexican American man with a beard and balding in glasses. And um, I am sitting in a room that also is the playroom for one of our cats. Wonderful. Matthew, can you go next? Certainly, uh, thank you for inviting me tonight. My name is Matt Donahue. I'm the director of roadway structures, which is effectively the bridge department for Seattle DOT. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm a middle-aged white male with uh, short and ever thinning brown hair, glasses, and I'm in what used to be our spare bedroom for visiting guests in our, um, our house in Ballard which is now my home office. It's a uh, rather nondescript room with white walls and a green curtain in the background. Wonderful, thank you. And Roger. The mic is on. All right. Okay. Follow the directions. My name is Roger Fernandez. I am a Native American artist. I belong to the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe of Western Washington. Um, I am a he, him. Uh, I am sitting in a, I'm a, I'm an elder, a native elder. I'm a grandpa, so that's kind of cool. Um, I am a sitting in a kitchen in an apartment in Ballard. Uh, there's a white um, kind of like cupboard behind me. And um, I'm so happy to be here. So uh, thank you for everyone um, for helping make this project happen. I really uh, learned a lot about a lot and I look forward to it. Thank you, Roger. And E.T. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Yeah, this is E.T. Um, my name is E.T. Russian. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and um, I'm here. Uh, I'm a white person with short brown hair um, in a room with a white wall behind me um, and a little bit of a, my bookshelf. And um, yeah, I'm just really glad to be here. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, so, as we launch into the program tonight, this artist in residency program has an extremely unique location um, perched above the roadway in one of the bridge towers at both the university and Fremont bridges. This project is funded through the Seattle Department of Transportation percent for art dollars um, and has had various iterations throughout throughout the years, giving artists from various backgrounds and expertise in which in which to work, watch, listen, and create. 
we've hosted poets, writers, musicians, and now comics artists to create in original creative artwork inspired by place. I am thrilled to be able to introduce Matthew Donahue as director of roadway structures and a major supporter and advocate for this unique project. Matt, would you like to say a couple words? Yes, thanks, uh, Marja. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, major supporter basically means all I have to do is say, yes, we can use the bridge, which is a super, or bridges in this case, which is a super easy thing for me to do. Um, when uh, a sometime colleague and predecessor uh, of Maja's, uh, Kristen Ramirez, came to me a couple years ago when I first started working for Roadway Structures at Seattle DOT and told me, that this was a thing, I was thrilled. I couldn't believe that we had this, you know, great long-standing uh, program that's a synthesis between publicly held infrastructure and the arts community. Um, for a long time, I've held that the practice of engineering, in some ways, is an art in and of itself, um, which tends to be pun intended a little bit more concrete and straightforward than other artistic processes. And so it's always been a, a great pleasure and joy of mine. And I think it's shared throughout Seattle DOT and certainly by Sam Zimbabwe, our director, um, that we get to have this practice where we, where we combine engineering uh, and art itself. Um, I really enjoyed the process of being involved with this program over the last few years uh, in all of its forms. I think it was last year was the first year that we uh, had a, an uh, artist in residence who was a musician. Um, I still listen to that piece frequently. I thought it was tremendous. And I have to say, I really, really enjoyed both of these uh, graphic novels. I've read through them uh, several times now each, and they touch on really uh, very important and essential conversations that we do have fairly regularly inside the DOT. How do we maintain infrastructure and a transportation network uh, and try to keep uh, people safe through our work in a place that wasn't originally ours. And so I found this work um, very touching and, and poignant for me personally, and also for the work that I do. So I applaud this program. I will support it in as much as I can for as long as I'm at the DOT. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks again for being invited tonight. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and I think saying yes is a major supporter and advocate, so thank you for that. <laughs> Um, we're also joined here tonight um, by Jose, who's serving as my co-moderator tonight. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with Jose um, as he served on as a member of the selection panel for this project. Um, Jose is a UW faculty, educator, comics advocate as well, um, and I'm excited to share the virtual stage with him tonight. Um, Jose, would you like to say a few words about tonight's program um, and introduce our main speakers? Hi, can you all hear me? Hi. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm having some technical problems, but I'm gonna go ahead and speak, assuming you all can hear me. And I've also cut and pasted the uh, comments that I'm going to give into the chat bar. That can also help for access. So um, if for some reason I cut off, you will know what I was trying to say. Um, so thank you, um, everyone. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, and good evening. Um, I want to thank uh, Maya, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and the artists we are honoring tonight for the chance to take part in this event, uh, which I'm very excited about. I wanted to say a few words about the power of combining images into sequences and combining images with words to create a story. In other words, the power of comics, or as some of us in academia sometimes call them, graphic narrative. Contrary to their reputation, at least going back to the 19th century, Comics are not an art form exclusively for kids. They never have been. They are also not simplistic. Comics, in fact, call for a great deal of engagement and, and imagination from readers. The words, if it has words in a comic, require a degree of literacy and fires up the part of, brain, of, of the brain involved in language processing. The pictures, which we tend to take in much faster and more readily than words, 
activates the part of our brain that handles visual forms, spatial arrangements. Or simple slide over someone's head, meaning I have a bright idea, right? So comics have a lot of little symbolic language like that. We need both parts of our brain working in tandem to make comics, to make sense of comics. But once uh, we have mastered this two track type of reading, we can come to appreciate all the things that make it unique as a communicative medium. For example, how it provides selected moments of an action, leaving us to fill in the rest, the composition of a page, how one panel follows another, how panels can have any number of shapes, sizes, relations between panels and between pages, the ways that text can blur into image, how text is in fact an organic part of image, the style, thickness, sweep of the lines in which the comic is drawn, what we have in the what we in the business call the artist's hand, and the ways that uh, you yourself, the reader, are driving the tempo of the story itself. You decide how long to take with a given panel or a line of dialogue. You choose to pause and reflect, to linger over the beauty of a page, to go back and re-experience it. All of these and other properties of the art of comics make it among the most interactive, and I believe among the most powerful of art forms, because of the unique ways in which we experience them. I am here to tell you that comics changed my life. Growing up in South Texas along the U.S.-Mexico border, the son of migrant farmers from a young age, comics opened up for me world after world that I could not access any other way. Better than radio, better than television and movies, these were private universes of superheroes and colorful drama that opened up unimagined horizons, all of which I was animating, bringing to life in my own mind with the turn of every page. On a more practical level, comics helped me to read better and to write better in English, which was not my first language, and they inspired me to create my own silly adventures with words and pictures. Many people give up comics as childish things. Moving on to more sophisticated fare. Well, um, I did go on to get to more sophisticated fare, but I also just never gave up on the comics. They rewired my brain and along with my parents made me feel that anything that I could conceive of was possible. They made me a better student. They made me a more moral person, believe it or not. They made me a better human being. That is the power of comics in my life. And all of the components of the art of comics that I've mentioned and more are put to subtle and exhilarating uses in the works of the artists that we are celebrating tonight. And uh, who knows, maybe we will uh, also end up changing some lives along the way. So without any further ado, and if you all still can hear me, um, am I still good? Yes, okay. Then I'll, I'll move on now to introducing our, our two artists starting with Roger Fernandez. Roger Fernandez is a Native American artist, storyteller, and educator. He is a member of the Lower Elwas Klallam tribe of Western Washington and was born and raised in the city of Seattle. He started his art career at the age of six, plagiarizing and copying artists like Joe Kubert and Mark Drucker, and those are very good artists to be copying, <laughs> making his own comic books. In his graphic novel works, he seeks to join traditional Coast Salish myths and legends and a modern world. He believes that the mythic stories told by all cultures inform and teach at a human to human story level. And since we're all still humans, these tellings can still do their powerful work. Roger was born in the city of Seattle and has a deep sense of the spirit of the city and how it has morphed over the past 20 years or so. The ship canal to Roger has always represented a clear delineation of white North Seattle and the much more racially diverse South Seattle. To cross the bridge was oftentimes more challenging than modern urban folk might realize. As the artist in residence at the Fremont Bridge, Roger created the graphic novel Change of Worlds, The Fremont Bridge Cycle, an opportunity to weave all these personal and cultural elements together. So please join me in welcoming uh, Roger Fernandez. Thank you so much, uh, Jose, for the uh, first, the uh, statement about comic books and graphic novels. Um, I was very um, anxious when I interviewed because uh, some of the things I wanted to talk about um, uh, stem from the philosophical aspect of looking at graphic novels and comic books. As a little kid, they were just my um, way of seeing the world and, um, and understanding the world. But uh, one thing that really informed the the work was one 
being familiar with Fremont, I'd, I'd worked for the city of Seattle and the Department of Neighborhoods for two years as a Fremont um, Neighborhood Service Center Coordinator. So I got to know got that, to know that. Office was right across the street from waiting for the interurban statue. Um, and so I got to know that bridge just in terms of uh, uh, the amount of work it did and the amount of traffic that was jammed there every day. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, a little bit of its history, a little bit of the um, um, cultural uh, context that I wanted to look at it through, um, I wanted to again bring a native perspective without being, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to say it, without kind of like lecturing people about this is the native way, this is a native culture, this is native belief. I just wanted to present things and allow the reader to um, discern for themselves, you know, this is an interesting concept of a of a bear carrying salmon through the, through the neighborhood of Fremont or salmon accepting the spirit of a man who jumped off the Aurora Bridge. Um, something like that where the audience um, is more involved in interpreting what they're seeing without me explaining as much as I might. Um, one of the first things I did was meet with um, some of the people on the bridge. There was fascinating stories. Uh, uh, one of the bridge tenders, uh, his uh, grandfather worked on the construction of the bridge and the canal itself. So I thought that might be a path to follow. Um, I met with someone, a historian for one of the local tribes and talked about the native people never had bridges. We had the same body of water. We had the same need to get from place to place. We never built bridges. Did he have a cultural perspective on that? And we talked about that quite a bit. Um, and so those kind of things informed, I guess, the big picture of what I was trying to do. Um, and also, I think you might notice that one of the stories focused on the Aurora Bridge, which is right practically above the Fremont Bridge. And originally, I called that chapter Big Sister, Little Sister. Um, but then I decided with the uh, tone of what that story was becoming, um, I needed something um, uh, to unify with the previous story. And, with, um, and so I called it Homecoming 2. Um, so, just a lot of opportunities to talk with folks, to get to meet people. Um, everyone is very supportive and interested in the idea. Um, the idea of uh, that bridge um, opening and closing much of it as it does, um, I think is kind of a, a fascinating exploration. Of, um, a couple of things I never thought about, which is water level and the bridge, uh, the height of the bridge and all those things that mean that the um, bridge, uh, I guess they foresaw that it would be opening as much as it does. So um, my stories then are linked through, I guess, a filter of things that I was taught by my native teachers, also my experience in Seattle. Um, the first story about the bear, um, part of that story is a mountain lion appeared in Discovery Park several years ago. Nobody knew how it got there, where it came from, what it was doing. They finally captured it and returned it, but I said, you know, animals, um, they still want to reach out to us in some way and connect with us. Um, and so, uh, and then we've seen in the pandemic now that animals are returning to places they hadn't been to in a long time. Uh, so a lot of that wove together in that story. Um, the bridge itself has the, um, the uh, yeah. work in one of the towers, the tower, the artist tower that I was in of uh, the Rapunzel story. But in talking about it with another storyteller, my partner, Fern Renville, um, she said, well, there's an older version of that. And there's an even older version of that. And so it turned out that Petrosinella was the uh, story that she said is uh, a very uh, precedes um, Rapunzel. So I said, well, let's go with that one. And it turned out to be a fascinating exercise of looking how um, a story might grow over the course of time and that it's shared in different ways. But um, you might notice that the telling of that story is based on a storyteller at the bridge telling the story. That again, um, orality, the idea of remembering the story and remembering other stories and sharing with the people with their voice, that was an important part of that story. Uh, the last one of uh, the, um, um, the Aurora Bridge and the fact that uh, many, many people jumped off the bridge um, and it took a while for people to decide we should put up some kind of a barrier maybe to, to um, uh, prevent that kind of uh, tragic act um, wasn't until a few years ago. And so uh, my imagination went with that one um, in terms of our connection, our human connection with the salmon. And for native people, it's a very um, uh, clear relationship with the salmon. Um, they are the, 
if you were to determine in a native perspective, this is what I've been taught by many elders, is that um, the world we live in is the salmon's world. It's not the human world. And so the salmon are the things that um, give shape and life to everything around us, including plants and insects and birds. Every, everything here relies on the salmon. So I wanted to make sure I had a story with salmon in it, but again, without explaining too much, um, allowing the viewer to, uh, or the reader to have a chance to put their own two cents in. Um, and I think one more thing before we take a look at what I created um, was uh, in the interview, I, I, I just, a few years ago, I just finished a book called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. I hope people can read that book. It's like a philosophical book. It's 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 way beyond just let's talk about comic books. But one thing he said that was profound to me was that um, the most important part of a page, in my pages and any page of the comic book, is not the images and the boxes. It is the space between the images and the boxes that we humans in our nature, we connect what the story that's being told in the images with another story that connects them. We automatically are putting ourselves within the story to create a complete story because you're only getting um, uh, whatever the artist or, or writer presents or the teller presents, you must complete the story yourself to help, help it make sense to you. I found that in my thinking and consciousness revolutionary that it's what I don't say is as important as I do say, because the, again, the reader is going to build the blank in blanks in themselves. And so part of my think, well, how little can I tell them to have a story that people can follow as a story, but also bring themselves deeper into the story to complete the story themselves. And so uh, you might notice a couple of the stories have very little dialogue, just a couple of words, maybe a written introduction. Um, and again, the intent was how do we allow the listener, the reader, the, um, the audience to be more engaged in that completing the story process. So um, again, all of that, was some of the philosophical stuff I tried to bring into this and I, I um, just really enjoyed the, the opportunity to do that. So I was going to ask Maya, she's got the first page up the cover. And um, as I was learning to be this little um, plagiaristic comic book maker, um, it was always the cover that would grab you first. And so I had to put on the cover. I studied graphic design to make covers and um, um, album, album covers too. If you remember what albums are. I want to make album covers to kind of, how do you create one image that conveys the the breadth of artistic creativity in the book or in the album? And so I enjoyed that. Um, and so I, I created a cover that I hope just uh, told enough of the story to, to interest the audience, but not enough to give away the stories themselves. Um, so what's a bear doing holding a salmon by the bridge and how can bear so big? And who's that woman in the green? And what are the little spirit figures at the bottom? So again, that's the cover and, uh, um, Coming up with the title, Change of Worlds, was a, is a passage from a speech by Chief Seattle. Um, I quote him at the end of the book um, that he's saying that dead, did I say dead? There is no death. There is only a change of worlds. And again, that's a native perspective on life um, and the afterlife and the con continuity of the spirit. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that um, I built on that. I just love when it struck me, Change of Worlds, that's a beautiful title. So I went with that. Um, so the cover again, very important to me. Um, it tells elements of the story, and I hope I hope people can see what's going on with the tower and Rapunzel and and the, the storyteller and uh, the bear. All those elements are there. All right. And again, I wanted to put that bear idea. There's a bear in Fremont. Uh, there's a mountain lion in Discovery Park. Um, hopefully, there's just a uh, uh, what would you call it? Uh, uh, a disconcerting effect. What would a bear be doing in the middle of a street in Fremont um, and uh, carrying a salmon? And so you can go ahead to the next section. Uh, wrote a little bit about the um, the bridge itself, uh, considered a, a, an engineering marvel at the time. Um, and also the, the idea of linking that with the idea that Western culture in our discussion about the bridge and, and um, um, that native people didn't have bridges. Um, the tribal historian said it, it's kind of a marker of how Western culture wants to improve nature. They want to fix it. They want to make it more convenient for us instead of accepting it and working with it as it is. And so I, I wanted to say something like that. So I did in the, in the text here. And I also noted that um, 
uh, just over 100 years ago, the Spanish uh, flu, um, that pandemic swept America. And the exact same time, this engineering marvel and other engineering marvels all around the country were being unveiled, the, the, the virus came and reminded us that there is a whole other aspect of life that is, uh, I'll, I'll say, um, more important than some of these developments that we have. So there's images of the bear running through Fremont. You might see the the uh, Tremont Fremont troll, the waiting for the interurban, the the boats uh, and the uh, the 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 skulls um, being or you know being paddled or or, or whatever they do with their with their oars to get through the waterway. Um, the bears going through the bridge, around the bridge, going down the stairs of the bridge, carrying a salmon. Um, Again, if we saw a bear going through the bridge, I don't know what your opinion would be. I'd be very fascinated. I'd have a lot of questions. So uh, there's a bear. Um, hopefully the image on the bottom right of that two page spread on the top. Um, I'm hoping people look in that bear in the bear's eyes and imagine what would I be asking this bear? What, what, how would I communicate with this bear? What's going on here? So regardless that that's uh, uh, the bridge, the, the, the bear is interacting with the bridge. And if you wanna go down to the next one. It's a pretty short story, pretty short story based on imagery, and it shows the bear. Um, I, I kind of wondered, all these straight lines that Western culture creates to define the world, straight lines and, and parallel lines and perpendicular, all these lines it creates, um, how would a bear or an animal see those lines? And so I put kind of a, a skewed version of perspective in there because um, that way of interpreting the world through straight lines might be very foreign to something like a bear or a human that grows up in a different kind of a culture. And there are um, plants and animals all around. Um, sometimes we don't see them. Um, and the bear approaches a, a homeless camp. And if you've been to the bridge and other bridges, you'll see uh, encampments all around. Um, and so I wanted to recognize that there's another culture of homeless people. There's another um, um, way of life going on within the life that we've identified. So the homeless folks, um, the bear, uh, the native man within the tent that he's approaching sees him, welcomes him in, the bear enters, and then I have a native design, a coast a Salish Indian design of a bear, a human, and a salmon. And the salmons at the bottom represent that it, it, it is a foundational, again, aspect of the culture of the bears and the humans, and also the humans and bears share the salmon, because that's what the salmon wants people to do. They want all the beings to share the gift that the salmon brings to them. So that design itself has a, an intention behind it as well. And I believe it's a close to a traditional Indian interpretation of how beings live in the world, that it's not just our world, that um, as Chief Seattle also said, we're only part of a web. We're only part of a web. And whatever we do on one part of the web affects the others. And so, so that design is meant to hopefully take us from the center of things. Um, okay. So then Petrosinella, uh, it's a telling of that story. I'm not gonna read the whole story. It's there for you to read. Um, I also wanted to compare um, Orality, the idea of images and spoken word um, that comes from your heart, your memory, versus the words that are written down. And that there's a person who knows the whole story of Potrosanella. And if you give her five minutes, she'll tell you that story. And um, so there's a young man who stops and she offers to tell the story. Um, I kind of like the, uh, he's walking down and uh, I just like the, uh, I, I don't know if it's ominous or what, but there, there is a Rapunzel, the uh, neon um, light Rapunzel in the in the um, window of the tower, and then it goes up closer to her, and she's just kind of watching him. Um, and then again, the the woman begins to tell the story of Petrosinella, which I think most of you probably recognize um, as uh, the Rapunzel story. For me, one of the stories I, when I mention it, most people can say, "Oh, I know that story, Rapunzel. I can tell that." So for whatever reason, that story resonates. Um, people have heard it a lot or are familiar with it enough to believe they, they know the arc of that story. But again, if you want to keep going a little bit further down. So the story so begins, the story. And, uh, and there's an interesting thing that I close with, again, that, that um, Fern revealed in telling the story that, um, and also in some reading I did of Atrocinella and Rapunzel, that um, it was not a, a, a wicked witch that, that took the little baby from the family. It was a loving grand, uh, godmother. 
and she took the child. And so it changes the whole story when you recognize this wasn't an act of um, cruelty or violence or, uh, or, or uh, an evil step mother or an evil witch. It was actually someone who was going to take care of this child, which to me shifts the whole meaning of the story. And then there's also some ultra violence at the end where, um, if you want to keep going a little bit further, um, where, uh, again, we're familiar with the, uh, the braid of hair coming out the window, coming down essentially from the sky, from a tower high above. And there are so many mythic stories, native stories included, where um, ropes or braids or spider um, um, webs are, are lowered from the sky and people come from the sky to the earth below. I think the mythic inference of that to me is, I'm still thinking about it. I wish I could say, I, I know what it means, I don't. Um, some people say it represents the umbilical cord. And so this is more a statement on birth itself, the meaning of the creation of life as it is to a braid or a rope. So again, there's the rope coming from up above and people use it to move up and down from one level of being to another level of being. So again, that's the kind of stuff that I'm hope I try to illustrate because the story is telling us these kind of things as well. And um, the story ends with uh, eyeballs being ripped out and legs being broken. And, and again, a, a fairly violent story, which you're probably familiar with. The uh, Brothers Grimm got a hold of the um, um, stories that were told in the villages in Northern Europe, and they had to clean them up for the consumers that they were planning to sell their books to. So they removed some of the things like eyeballs being torn out or even the birth of a child or the pregnancy uh, that came from the, the, the young man visiting her in the tower. Uh, just an interesting look at how stories can be changed for, I guess you could say, uh, social reasons. So anyway, it closes with that. And then also um, uh, the offer, she has more stories to tell. And I think as a good storyteller, you want to leave the audience knowing there's more stories we can tell and listen to. So again, it's a story uh, that a lot of people are familiar with, but there's another version of it. And then if you want to go down a little further, we'll start the homecoming to- Rock, I'll just do a quick time check. We probably have about four or five more minutes um, to be able to make sure there's lots of time for questions. What a coincidence. I, that's what, exactly what I'm going to need. Okay. Um, and so again, I looked at the, the Aurora Bridge right above it. And um, again, having worked there, I know that it's a powerful presence, um, but also the fact that people were jumping off that bridge. And there have been different articles I was reading too that said that nobody's, there's no theme that says, here's why they do it. Everyone has their own story to tell. Was it a plan? Was it impulse? What was going on? And it took a long time before they built this uh, suicide prevention fence. So this is a story of a, a man, don't know who he is. Um, I try not to re resort to stereotypes to say this man is obviously an Asian American or an African American or a white American, white European American. Um, I just draw a character that hopefully people will read into it and say, I'm not sure what that is, but I think it. And so anyway, he um, jumps off the bridge and he climbs uh, the fencing, which is really simple. If you walked along the bridge, you realize that fencing originally was just about to most adult waists. And so if a person um, chose to uh, go over that, it was pretty easy to do. And so as he's going, as he's jumping, he, um, he, he encounters a crow flying by. And um, that connection of spirit, which is crucial to native identity and understanding of the world and philosophy, um, that crow looks at him looks at him in the eye as he's falling from the bridge. And then um, uh, he lands in the water. There's salmon in the water. And he crashes into the water. Um, and right away, so if you want to go down one more section, on the right, he's uh, crashing into the water. The salmon are kind of swimming away. But his spirit is leaving his body. And their spirits are already um, on their journey to complete their, their life cycle. And so one more section, the bottom one, the last one. And so his spirit, which is the top one with the hands up raised, the human hands up raised, is welcomed by the salmon spirits to come join them. Come join us. We're returning to the mountains. We're returning to the source of all life. We're returning to the place where we were born. Come with us. And so he joins them. His spirit joins them. And they return to the mountains. Um, and it's as simple as that. That's that's the story that I wanted to tell. That blending of spirits, that a human spirit and a salmon spirit, they can communicate, they can travel together, um, they can join each other. And so then 
the last page is the uh, Chief Seattle quote that um, uh, there is no death, there is only a change of worlds. And so again, a native perspective on, we don't see death as the end of something. We see it as a part of a, a, a long journey. And so when we leave this body, we're on a, another leg of that journey. And so that's the spiritual nature of, of how the people see that. So again, I was trying not to be too um, busy trying to create native culture and just allow it to unfold in the um, in the images I drew in the story I told. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is Jose, is Jose muted? Can you all hear me now? Okay. Um, so again, my apologies for the uh, uh, connection, but thank you very much, um, Roger, for that wonderful presentation. I will go on now to our second uh, artist tonight. So our second artist is E.T. Russian. Physical therapist, therapist, performer, and artist, E.T. is a member of the legendary Disability Justice Arts and Culture organization Sins Invalid from Berkeley, California. E.T. has more than 20 years of experience making comics and zines and has in recent years expanded into multimedial and multisensory artwork on view in such venues as the Jack Straw New Media Gallery and the Kittredge Gallery. In 2014, I left, left Bank Books published the Ring of Fire Anthology, a collection of E.T.'s landmark zine, Ring of Fire. Upon its release, poet and author Eli Clare pronounced, quote, the Ring of Fire Anthology is beautiful, sexy, and thought-provoking all at the same time. If ever you've needed stories, art, poetry, and badass rabble housing that connect disability and queerness, sexiness, and radical anti-capitalist politics, Look no further. E.T. Russian's vivid work lives and breathes these connections. End quote. As the artist in residence at the University Bridge, E.T. created the 28 page mini comic, The Canal Was Cut, which explores the elements of air, water, wind, and earth, the human relationship to spirits, nature, and animals, themes of living and dying, colonization and landowning, decompressing from work, and dreams. So please. Uh, help me uh, to welcome uh, the wonderful artist and my good friend, E.T. Russian. Oh, Jose, that was so nice. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I'm I'm really excited to be here. Really honored. So I think I'm. Uh, I have my little comic book. These will be uh, Rogers, and my comics will be available uh, at the Seattle Public Libraries for free when the libraries reopen after COVID. So that's something to look forward to. But for right now, I have a small stack of these at my house, and it's so satisfying. Um, but uh, Roger, what you made was just so stunning. I mean, not just was incredible. Thank you so much um, and everything you shared. Um, so I think what I'll do is read my comic and describe it uh, and then I'll talk afterward with whatever time I have left. So, um, okay, Maya, so I need to do screen share. Okay, at the bottom center, there's a little box with the arrow pointing up. Oh, that and says share. share. Okay. Okay. Great, we see your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll just read it and I'll describe the imagery. So, uh, the canal was cut by E.T. Russian. Uh, this is the cover image. It's a drawing in two shades of blue, a light blue and a, and a more like a royal blue. And, um, the drawing is of the University Bridge in Seattle over the Lake Washington Ship Canal. Um, and you see the water flowing underneath. And then in the sky, uh, you see a cloudscape. And in the cloudscape is a salmon uh, swimming in the sky. 
next image is an aerial view of Lake Union in Seattle, what's called, uh, what colonizers named Lake Union. And um, highlighted are the two bridges. So like Roger was saying that he was at Fremont Bridge in the shadow of the Aurora Bridge. I was at University Bridge in the shadow of I-5. Um, so it's interesting to be a bridge in the shadow of a bigger bridge. And Seattle is a city with a lot of bridges. So now I'll read from the text. I grew up in a place with a lot of bridges. I always wondered why each drawbridge had two towers. One was for the operator, but what was the other one for? Apparently the city wondered the same thing. They turned the towers into art residencies. Okay, the next image is a drawing of a healthcare worker doing telemedicine during a pandemic. So you see the hand sanitizer, you see the gloves, you see the uh, the healthcare provider with a headset on in front of a keyboard with a client's chart on the screen, and they have their head turned to a laptop, a separate computer screen, and you see uh, someone in a power wheelchair with a ventilator um, talking on the screen saying, COVID's hard. As essential workers in a hospital, we do the work of healing. That doesn't always mean people go back to the way they were before. Can you hear me? I ask when we connect through a screen. You tell me about your dad's cancer, your mom's dementia, and your neck pain. Okay, this next drawing is of someone with a ponytail hunched over their cell phone playing video games in their car. That's a self-portrait. <laughs> okay. The text says, making art during a pandemic is like trying to wring water from a stone. I feel like something that landed with a thud. Next page. They wave at me and I wave back. So this is a next page. This is a drawing of um, the bridge tower, the drawbridge tower at the university bridge. And you see somebody up in the tower, which is me basically the artist. Um, and then you see somebody crossing the bridge and uh, waving. They see the person up in the tower and they wave so it's this really physically distanced social interaction, like the kind that we're having during COVID, where people are masked and waving at each other from a distance. Next page. It feels like. Next page. Is a wordless image. It's just a drawing of the person with the mask on and they're waving to the person in the tower. And you can't see the lower half of their face, but in their eyes, you can see that it's a moment of connection. Next page. Take a moment to tune in, turn towards, to listen. Next page. So this is a drawing of somebody who's walking across the bridge the university bridge and they pause halfway across the bridge to just look out at the view and kind of holding on to the railing. They're just standing there taking a moment and just sort of like the traffic is passing behind them, but they're turned away from that and they're turned toward the water and the sky. And you see that they're in the middle of a city. You see buildings and stuff, but they're they're over water and that's what they're turning towards. This next image is a drawing of an island with trees. And you see the water in the water is reflected the shadow of the trees and you see more trees uh, in and land in the distance. It's a very Pacific Northwest type of image. This is actually a drawing of an island um, that colonizers named Pritchard Island. 
Okay, so next page. I live in South Seattle, where Pritchard Island is no longer an island because Lake Washington dropped nine feet in depth when the land was cut by developers. Next page. This is a drawing of when the land was cut between Lake Washington and Lake Union. So they were two separate lakes and in the 19 teens, they were cut um, just this huge gash in the earth and um, Lake Washington was nine feet higher in elevation than Lake Union. So when that cut went through the water level of Lake Washington dropped nine feet to match that of Lake Union. And so you see the people working on the cut, you see the laborers on either side doing the cut and you see the water just flowing out of uh, rushing out of uh, Lake Washington into Lake Union, just like this huge gash that's just like bleeding out of control. Um, and you see the water, the lines of the water flowing into Lake Union are very chaotic and rough and there's a lot of, um, tumult and turbulence in the water. Next page. The cutting of the Lake Washington Ship Canal forever changed the lakes, the Black River, and the spawning of the salmon. Next page. So this is a drawing and it says ship canal. And so it's kind of an aerial map of uh, part of Seattle where you see the ship canal. And then underneath south and it says northeast, west, south. So north of the ship canal is just white. South of the ship canal, you see parts um, kind of a grid of our areas of land blocked off where black and Asian residents in the 1950s in Seattle were living. And so the point of this image is to show that black and Asian residents uh, were not living in North Seattle because of the history of uh, land owning. Um, there, uh, there was uh, discrimination in land owning uh, for people of color and native folks in North Seattle above the ship canal. So the ship canal is a significant landmark of that. So this is just trying to show that. The Ship Canal is a landmark of redlining in Seattle, yeah. of racial discrimination in land and home owning. This bridge is built on that chasm. During my residency, a new park opened on the waterfront near the bridge. They moved a police station to build it, took out the bulkhead and sloped soil down into the lake waters, an effort to rebuild the shoreline. Can a shoreline be repaired? Like a relationship can be repaired? How do we arrive for the harm we've caused? The next image, uh, the next page is a drawing of the University Bridge drawbridge opening up. You see a ship coming through underneath. And in that opening, a cloud emerges into the sky. And in that cloud is a salmon flying, swimming in the sky in cloud form. Next page is another drawing. This is of Lake Union. You see all the people boating going by, little speedboats and kayaks and rowboats and all different kinds of boats. And they're creating all these different currents in the water. And so you see the effects of movement in the water and, and that interaction. And you also see uh, the trees and the mountains in the distance. Um, you see some buildings along the shore and some boats. And then in the very distance, you see uh, the salmon migrating in cloud form uh, in the sky. Next page. Soar fish, swim high above, over your waters. Do you recognize them? 
Next page. Dive, bird. Float under surface, beneath your skies. Sing a song of home. So this image, this next page is an image of a bird, a pie, I think it's called pie-billed grebe, um, which is a native bird um, to this area. Um, and you see the university bridge and you see a speedboat going by, some recreational boat creating a lot of turbulence in the water and um, bubbles in the water. And you see the bird flying down um, kind of close into that uh, turbulent bubbly water. Next page is an image of a, the bird now flying underwater, kind of in this bubble um, that has been transported to underwater. And you see bubbles coming up from the mouth, rising up to the surface. When we reflect on a place and recognize its beauty, we are called to care for it. So that's the end of my comic. And um, I just uh, say that the comic was made on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish, a people that are still here today. And I thank all the people um, who uh, supported me in making the comic and just had really thoughtful conversations with me kind of as I was processing this material, uh, including my friend Genevieve, who I think is here tonight. Um, so just big thank you. And yeah, so I'll, I'll end that. I'm sharing. Click to exit. And Beautiful. Sharing. Okay. So, um, gosh, I have some notes on what to say. I think Maya, how much time do I have? Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, it's about, gosh, time has flown. It's about five to eight, but I want to be able to get, get oh, you. Get I don't you. want, I don't need to say much, except I did a lot of research and reading and I went to the bridge about two to three times a week for four months and read a lot about basically the colonization of the land and waterways of Seattle. And I didn't have a title for the comic until literally the midnight hour. Like I had made the whole comic. I had drawn all the drawings. I had written all the t text and I still didn't have a title. And then it came to me because it's like, everyone knows that the Lake Washington ship canal is the Lake Washington ship canal. But the meaning of the word canal had not really uh, landed for me that a canal is a cut waterway. It's essentially a scar. It's a man-made cut waterway. It is not a natural thing. And so just saying the canal was cut, I mean, it's already implied in the word canal, but I felt like I could just name it, that a canal is a cut thing. Because basically it's like, I think we all know that the canal is there, but most people don't register that that was a cut waterway because it had, everlasting effects on the ecology of the area. And I think when we recognize that, we can start to think about how do we even try to make amends for that, <laughs> you know, because it had lasting impact on people and nature and everything. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing I wanna say. And then everyone at the bridge was so welcoming. I know Barb is here. Barb is one of the bridge operators, just wonderful. Hi. and. Um, my last shout out that I want to give is that, um, you know, this was a place of refuge for me during COVID, um, somewhere hopeful, somewhere I felt connected, even though I couldn't be around people. And I just felt this was, utter I'm utterly grateful. Um, I also was going through a lot of medical things during this residency, like multiple medical things. And so it was also really helpful for me for that. And I, uh, but I do want to say this is not a wheelchair accessible um, residency. I was on, I have artificial legs and I was on one leg for over a week where I was like on one fake leg and crutches trying to get up the stairs. It was difficult. Um, and so I, I want to give a shout out to anyone who helps create art spaces to urge people to create more wheelchair accessible residency spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to make these kind of spaces available to all, like all people. 
but um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you so much, E.T. and Roger, both for sharing your um, in incredible work, your powerful insight, and just an, an amazing reflection on the time and the place. Um, we do, I'm hoping to extend by just a couple minutes to be able to have a couple of questions come in if anybody has them. Um, there's the Q&A function, and also if you'd like to be unmuted, um, you can request that and I can, um, make that adjustment to verbally ask your question. I'm hoping to like um, ETU commented a little bit on this. Um, I've just like, and Roger may be asking you to say a few words about just kind of the, the experience of being in that space, something that you didn't expect. Um, the tower bridge towers themselves are a little bit different from one another, but I know from, you know, that first walkthrough that we did and you got the key that you spent some quality time in that space. And I'd love to hear just some reflections of of your experiences. And Roger, do you wanna to speak to that? Sure, in the tower, um, it was a, a, a nice, comfortable space. Um, also put in a plug for restroom facilities. Um, just got to say it. Uh, um, thanks to the neighbors of the bridge to, to uh, allowing us. And I also appreciated the fact that um, during COVID, I had a chance to just go somewhere and, and uh, read and talk and, and draw. Um, but the, uh, inside the room, there was uh, some old levers that apparently it was used uh, as one of the other control room. I, I'm assuming they had various old ways of controlling the, the movement of the bridge, the opening and closing of the bridge. And so there were some, um, levers that were there, some big levers were in there and, and, um, I tried, but they were like welded. So I couldn't do anything, but it was interesting to see that at 1 time, the technology was, uh, much more based on. Humans interacting with the levers, the machines to get the bridge to go up versus now, um, if I understand it, right, there's a lot of buttons now and there's still a huge mechanical process going on. Um, so. The experience of the bridge was um, very uh, interesting, and then also to we were had a tour of the under section of the bridge, the part that people don't see, and it was uh, uh, I would say intimidating. Just the amount of uh, levers and machines and cogs and wheels and noise and all of that going on underneath the bridge. So. Um, um, on the outside, uh, I think they're, they they do a good job of making sure it doesn't seem as uh, imposing as it is underneath the bridge. I thought about doing something underneath the bridge, but then I said, no, that would call for drawing too much. One other thing I, I noticed is that to draw that bridge and to draw the town and the city all around it, you got to draw a lot of straight lines. And when you get involved in straight lines, now you got to deal with perspective and make sure that people can read the convergence of all these points. And, and I said, I don't want to draw that many straight lines here. So um, I ended up uh, just, um, you might see if you look at the, the novel again, in terms of straight lines, there were only a few pages where there was a lot of um, industrialized straight lines going on. Um, I found that would had to be a decision to make in terms of, uh, of uh, again, meeting the, the expectation of, a city of straight lines, buildings of straight lines, streets of straight lines, wires of straight lines, all these things. And um, that to me is a, is, is a cultural statement unto itself. And when they took care of doing the cut of the canal, they made sure it was a straight line too, instead of having a, a curving flowing body of water, a river or a slough or whatever it was, they said, we got to straighten this sucker out so people can travel in it. So again, um, the idea of the straight line, um, I didn't talk about it in the the novel itself, but um, it, it played a part. I just didn't want to draw that many straight lines all the time. Et, is there anything you'd like to add to that question about your experience of being up there? Okay. Wonderful. I know a burning question coming through, and I'm actually not seeing a lot of questions come through. Is how to get how to get your hands on the actual 
phys physical copies of these books. Um, so we have about 150 printed. Um, I have a list of everyone who registered for this, as well as um, doing a download of everyone who attended today. Once um, our physical location at King Street Station is able to open back up, I'll be sending out an email of kind of advance notice to be able to come and pick one up for free. We'll limit it to one per person, but you'll also be able to, if you know somebody who attended, who lives at, out of the area, you, you'll be able to pick that up and come to some arrangement to mail that or something, but we, we, we are, aren't able to mail it for you. We're also going to be dropping off five copies to the Seattle Public Library, um, and so then you'll be able to check those out, and they'll, um, they'll be at certain branches and can be requested throughout the system. Um, and so if you're not able to or someone hears of it later that wants to be able to see the in-hand version of the book, Seattle Public Library will have them as part of our collection. Wonderful. Well, I'm not seeing many questions. It's just after eight. I wanted to just give a huge thank you um, to SDOT for being a supporter of this project and um, letting artists take over that space for a, a couple of months to really make it their home away from home for the incredible artistic talent and vision that both Roger and ET brought to this project to really be able to put so much incredible power into the pages of the book that will last a long, a long time. I'm just so thankful for that and being able to work from you, work with you as well. Um, special thanks as well to Jose for joining me today and to the other selection panelists who were able to um, work pretty closely to review applications to um, be able to select Roger and ET for this opportunity. Um, and that is all I have for tonight. Just a huge- It was a great pleasure. Great. Thank you. And if, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this will be available on our website for the full um, recording if you missed any of it. Have a lovely evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.